Patsy Zahari. And how do you pronounce your last name? I always call it my husband, yeah. so it doesn't really matter. Okay. <laughs> She, come, she comes from a minor corporation, uh, it's a consulting company to the uh, U.S. Uh, government. And Marcy uh, joined Miter in 2005 as a manager for training and knowledge management integration. And in this role, she established and managed Miter's fast forward team. Sounds like important team. Training. Fast forward training team, okay which is responsible for providing training to help staff effectively use MITRE's IT tool set. But believe me, the Marcy's expertise is beyond IT tools. Um, Marcy is currently a knowledge management principal supporting the Director of Knowledge Services, and she uh, works with advanced knowledge management in MITRE championing efforts which support all staff collaborations, knowledge sharing, and strengthening MITRE's knowledge base. And prior to her arrival at MITRE, she worked for the Department of Defense, another government agency, for 15 years in various positions to include security management, intelligence analysis, wow, and training management. She holds degrees in business management for uh, her bachelor's degree and master's degree in business education and PhD in computing technology in education. So with that, please join me welcome in Marcy. So hello everybody. As Kehoe mentioned, I'm Marcy Zahari. I am the Enterprise Service Manager for Knowledge Management at the MITRE Corporation. Thanks so much for setting us all up this morning, Paul. A fantastic uh, presentation. I actually first met Paul at APQC, where I still remember his presentation to date on the Bechtel Apprentice, if I even said that correctly. Always a hard act to follow. I will try and be up there with, and, uh, with all the expectations that he had set earlier. So here's the things I'll be talking about, four areas. First, I'll tell you a little bit about MITRE and our strong knowledge sharing culture. Talk a little bit about our long-standing knowledge transfer practices. This is all about the people here at MITRE. And go in a little bit about our multi-generational workforce challenges and then wrap it up with showing you this famous chart of how we are the land of letting a thousand flowers bloom when it comes to our tool set and focus in on a social networking tool that we've been using internally for about a year. So first a little bit about MITRE. MITRE was founded in 1958. We're a non-for-profit. We manage four federally funded research and development centers. The areas are supporting the DOD, the FAA, the IRS, VA, and most recently, within this last year, Department of Homeland Security. We're about 7,000 people, about 65 locations. We do not compete with industry. We do not manufacture goods or, um, or products. Our, our product is our knowledge in supporting our customers. Perhaps it's this way. There we go. A little bit about our knowledge management program. Jane Tatalius, our Director of Knowledge Services, will tell you that when she came, became the Director of Knowledge Services about 12 years ago, it was the first time that the word knowledge management would stick. You can throw it against the wall and it would stick. As opposed to people saying, knowledge what? You manage what? And she has done a great job as our, um, I guess the equivalent in industry would be um, um, Chief Knowledge Officer. It's more of a planning and strategy role in the company. She reports directly to our CIO. Our mission is really about fostering the existing knowledge sharing culture that we have to, at MITRE, and it's about bringing the corporation to bear. And I'll tell you a story about that on another slide. We're more of a champion in terms of um, what there are activities that we do uh, initiate from an enterprise uh, knowledge management perspective, but there are also efforts that roll up from the centers. We have center knowledge managers, I guess that equivalent would be business units for industry. And we work with them, we, we meet on a quarterly basis so they can see what we're planning from an enterprise perspective and so that we can see what they're planning from the grassroots effort so that we all are supportive of one another. Knowledge management at MITRE is not one system. We do not have a knowledge management system. We have many tools to enable knowledge sharing. And it's not about uh, one thing, it's about a lot of little things, as this chart will show you. 
And no, I will not spend all day on this chart, I promise. <laughs> Very easy to do. So just trying to chunk up the data a little bit. Across the top is the investments we've made from, from, from the early days of technology across the top. And uh, across the bottom are some knowledge management organizational events as well as some awards we've won for our KM program. So I'll just pick out a few things. So across the top, 1994, long, long time ago, the adv advent of, I think, the World Wide Web about that time. We, were, we spent a lot, of, a lot of time in MITRE creating what we have now as the MITRE Information Internet. So if I say MII, that's what that is. That is our internal portal to all of our information. One of the things we have on there is a phenomenal phone book. And the, the, way, the reason that phone book has been so successful, and I know everybody can appreciate this, is it's not, there's no manual entry required. It is pulled from our PeopleSoft database. It is pulled from our financials so that anyone um, at MITRE, when they go to a phone book page, can see a picture of somebody, what their job level is, where they physically are working at, what their phone number is, what their address in. You can, you can, we have an integration with Outlook so you can see if they're busy. We have an integration with Office Communicator so you can see if it's red, yellow, or green for those of you who, who work on uh, Office Communicator. And it's all pulled. It doesn't have to be manually updated, so it's very successful. We get, um, I, uh, I think, it's about 7,000 searches a month on the phone book. Moving across the top, um, some things that everyone else probably have struggled with over the years and invested in. We brought in um, a corporate taxonomy in 2002. We brought in Google for 2000 and 2003. We brought in SharePoint, everybody's favorite, right? <laughs> um, in 2004, we opened up SharePoint for our sponsors uh, the year after. We, uh, we looked at a, we did a quick study on social network analysis. We brought Patty Anklin in to take a look at who's talking to who. We uh, have our own version of, of Wikipedia. We call it Miterpedia, not, not so creative title there. And last, a couple years ago, you can see over on the right-hand side, it says Onomy. That is our social bookmarking tool. We wanted to be able to have one, um, like is it uh, Delicious and Dig? Very similar internally. And then most recently, and I'll talk about this at the end of the presentation, is our social networking pilot that's built off an open, open system platform called ELG, and that we use both internally and externally, and I have some screenshots of that. Well, also last year we worked, uh, we were playing with uh, Indeca for faceted search. So across the bottom, our first technology exchange in 1997, I'll talk a little bit about that on another slide, so you have to pay attention. I can't tell you everything now. We were awarded uh, Best Practice Partner for Managing Content in 2001 from APQC. And again, in 2008, APQC Award for Expertise Finding in Social Networking. Last year, we won the Most Admired Knowledge Enterprise for North America from the Telos Group, as well as the Internet Award with, I always say this wrong, Nielsen, help me, the Internet Awards. Nielsen, another N there. Oh, well. Somebody will think of it and yell it out. So as you can see, our CAM at MITRE has been a journey. I don't know if there's a destination. It keeps going, and that's a good thing. So we have a very rich knowledge sharing culture. And one of the questions that's always asked of us when, when we meet other knowledge management practitioners is, where, how, did knowledge, how did you get such a, a, a rich knowledge sharing culture? Where did it all begin? And to me, looking at the videos and talking to the records and archives folks, it began in 1958. So think back. Those of you who weren't born then, don't answer the question. <laughs> but for the rest of us, 1958, what was going on then? Yeah. Very good. Yes, exactly. So that's the era. And how big was a computer? <laughs> we didn't have these. <laughs> so in 1958, when MITRE was founded, 52 years ago, Bob Everett, 37 years old, the founder of MITRE, had this humongous task of being the lead systems engineer on the semi-automatic ground environment, an early warning system against the Soviet Union, with Sputnik and all the other things that were going on. Um, so here's this 37-year-old. How are you going to do this? It ended up being, I'll uh, take you in, in time a little bit, um, say, the SAGE system ended up being 22 
three-story buildings around the world. And as you mentioned, computers were the size of this room at the time. And this actually predates me. Punch cards? Something like that? Yeah. Um, so if Bob Everett knew 52 years ago that to, to be the lead systems engineer required knowledge from industry, academia, um, with the government and trying to find these MITRE folks to, form, to, to be a part of this company. He knew so early on that it required knowledge sharing and collaboration to make this system. And that culture has set with MITRE from day one and it still exists. In fact, uh, I was, I've only been at MITRE for five years. The first week I was here, I had a phone call from someone I, I had worked with before at MITRE that said, hey, your resume needs to be in your transfer folder, your dissertation work needs to be in your transfer folder, because when people are looking for expertise, they have to know how to find you. And six months after I was at MITRE, I had a phone call from one of our MITRE staff in Nebraska that said, hey, I found this knowledge transfer, um, our knowledge audit that you had done in your previous company that you talked about. Can you tell me what you did? Can you share it with me so I can help my sponsor? We need to do this. So I helped him out, and a few months later, I got an email back saying, you know, your information you gave me was great. This is how I used it. This is how the sponsor appreciated it. It's a, just a very rich knowledge sharing culture. So what are some of our longstanding practices, or, or some, a little bit more about the knowledge sharing culture? It's at all levels of the organization. The picture up on the right is Al Grasso, our president and CEO. This picture was taken at our ninth annual Knowledge Management Awards uh, ceremony last year. His opening speech was, MITRE is a knowledge company. And it requires, um, it depends on the networking of our knowledge workers to be able to be um, successful. So it's at the highest levels of the organization. Our business framework goal, goal six, is arming the knowledge worker. Our knowledge management strategy, goal number one, is about people-to-people -people knowledge transfer. Uh, Dave mentioned earlier, as, as well as Paul, it's about the, we have a lot of technology, but it still boils down to the people. It's about the networking. We're a highly matrixed organization, hard to get used to if you haven't been in one before, because you work on a lot of programs, but it allows you to meet a lot of people. It allows you to meet more, uh, to learn more things, and most importantly, exchanging the lessons learned and best practices across the organization. Bringing the corporation to bear. I mentioned I would say a little bit about that. I had no clue what that meant when I joined MITRE. And within the first week at MITRE, I was in the same room as our CAO, trying to figure out small talk. Because you know, a bunch of engineers, introverts, all they do is look at their shoes. So I'm trying to figure out something that I can say to impress him. So I was like, hmm, hmm, I got it. I keep hearing this phrase. I said, Joel, what is bringing the bear to the corporation mean? And he looked at me and he burst out laughing. It's like, this is not a good start. He said, no, it's called bringing the corporation to bear. And what that means <laughs> is everybody at MITRE has the responsibility, and because we have a great tool set, they have the capability of reaching back to MITRE to be able to find expertise when we need it to help solve our customers' most challenging problems. And bringing the corporation to bear is just is really a theme at MITRE. And one of the more, most recently, or in the last couple of years, is um, not only does our CIO want us to be the, the smartest person in the room, but if we can't be, we want to be the most networked person in the room, both internally and externally. So now our theme has changed a little bit, not only bringing the corporation to bear, but bringing the community to bear. And when I get into showing you the screenshots of Handshake, which is our social networking tool, that's one of the things we created it for, is so that we have a social, have a social networking tool to be able to communicate with sponsors, academia, and our customers. Our job levels, when you go online to, to see when am I ever going to get promoted, one of the things that, that are, are explicit in there is you have to be a sought after speaker, you have to show that you have shared knowledge, you have to show that you have published, um, and made connections like this. So make sure you tell that to Jean when you see your keyhole that I was here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Knowledge transfer activities, some of our long standing practices, and they outdate me. I probably talked enough about the reach back with bringing the corporation to bear, but I had the opportunity of being able to read through some of the, the data from our customer surveys last year. They fill out little report cards. And one of the questions is what do you value most about MITRE? What makes you keep coming back to MITRE as an FFRDC? Hands down, 
It was about the reach back and bringing the community to bear and the corporation to bear. Sponsors appreciate that and they expected that if their MITRE staff member that is, is next to them in the office, if they don't know something, they use our technology to reach back to MITRE to find out the answer. Technical exchange meetings, we call these TEMs. And they've been around, although I can't find when the first TEM was in our records and archives, but I'm working on it. But it, talking to people, it dates back to about 1997. Um, they are meetings that anyone at MITRE can, can call. And when I say can call, we give them some tools to help them. We give them a TEM builder where they fill out information about their TEM. And then our content management system takes, sends that information across the company. You can set up for alerts. You can go to a TEM site. And the TEM site lists all of the TEMs. And it also we also provide them with a SharePoint site to be able to use as a project repository for the TEM um, presentations. So you can do a Google search to be able to, to find those presentations later. Part of the SharePoint site, we set up a registration so that people who are interested in those particular topics can register. So it doesn't mean that they all show up. That's not really the intent. The intent is, hmm, gosh, there was this TEM last week on, um, on SOA. I really need to know more about SOA, but I missed it. Oh, I can go back to the, temp, the SharePoint site, see the presentations, and I can see who else has an interest in that area. Perhaps they're an expert. It gives me a list of people to contact from there. We did a quick look study on TEMS last year. We looked at about an 18-month period of time. Uh, we held, in, held TEMS June 08, January 08 to June 09. And there was about 100 TEMS that were one to two hours for, for that 18-month period of time. And there was about 90 TEMS that were a half day to full day. And looking through how many people registered, we looked at there was about 40 people that attend these TEMS. So when you're looking at manpower, that's over 3,000 people over an 18-month period of time. 3,000 people that think TEMS are, are a good avenue for knowledge transfer, that they're going to find, some, they're going to expand their network, they're going to learn something new. So uh, a, a, very, a very good thing at MITRE, and it's often in our P&Ds at the end of the year that we need to host a TEM. Project review is probably very similar to all of you. Um, the other things are the brown bag series, the tech talks, the networking circles, the world cafes, kind of all the same title for the same thing. Informally, people getting together to talk about what they're working on and sharing, and sharing knowledge. And lastly, communities of interest. I'm pointing this out because I think there is a difference between a community of interest versus a community of practice. To me, community of practices, and I know a lot of you in the room have these, to me, those are more formal. There's a specific charter. There's a specific outcome. You have a community leader uh, that makes people answer questions. Um, communities of interest at MITRE, again, self-forming like TEMS are. The only thing at MITRE that is mandatory is filling out your time card. Um, so that there are things that are, people are encouraged to do, but no one ever <coughs> makes anybody do them. So communities of interest, self-forming, any other list serves, anybody can start one, anybody can join one. We have about 2,000 list serves at MITRE. Looking at the stats on Friday before I left the office, uh, for the metrics, there was 95,000 messages sent to 1,500 list serves over a 30-day 30, 30 period of time as of last Friday and going backwards. Very common way of asking questions to other MITRE staff to be able to get information. More recent knowledge management, or excuse me, knowledge transfer initiatives. We, when I say center, it's business unit, so we have four centers at MITRE. Uh, they all have their own individual onboarding process after the corporate onboarding process. Um, all of them talk about knowledge sharing and collaboration at MITRE. Reserved at the ready, this is something that MITRE was recognized for in 2001 by AARP. And this is when folks at MITRE have retired and they still want to continue working but part-time. So we call them PTOC, part-time on call, so that we're able to reach back and bring them back when we need them. Uh, we do this with secretaries. If some secretaries are out, bringing in a secretary who's familiar with MITRE um, is really helpful. We also do this with the technical staff to work on more on, on projects that we get. The Fridays at Home Office, this is something that, starts, that started a few years ago by a select a few centers. And basically, a lot of MITRE is co-located with their sponsor, so you don't get the opportunity of being back to the main campus. So a couple of the centers have said, hey, sponsors, we really need our MITRE folks back here so that we can continue our knowledge sharing and collaboration. 
So they work back at the main office on Fridays to uh, exchange lessons learned, to, um, to participate in training, and kind of get caught up on what's going on in the organization. Storytelling, uh, we talked a lot about that this morning, and there is, uh, storytelling is in pockets at MITRE. The largest one is with our F the FAA. Um, if you can imagine, when you're trying to come up with the next generation air traffic management system, you know, it's, it's kind of boring when all you got is a bunch of bullet parts, points, but if you can create a story and a picture and a video, it's much easier to relay what you're trying to get across to your sponsor and what would be a good idea. In fact, they've gotten so far that they actually have a formal class within um, that particular center on, coming, on doing storytelling. The technology and knowledge transfer, I actually went to our knowledge transfer office a couple weeks ago asking them what they did. And besides setting up the tech exchange for transferring, I mentioned before that MITRE doesn't produce, any, but doesn't produce anything. That's probably not true. We do have knowledge. Um, they don't actually manufacture things. We do do prototypes. And at the completion of a prototype, we either need to turn that over to the government, or to our sponsor, or another contractor. So that has to be packaged up some way. So the, the, our knowledge transfer um, office not only focuses in on the, the drawings and the, the explicit knowledge, but they now make it the tacit knowledge, that, that knowledge flow that goes behind all of the explicit knowledge as a part of transferring to, to the government or, or a contractor. Mentoring programs, probably the same as other places, young to old, as well as the um, boomers trying to learn uh, the new technology from the millennials. Our innovation zone, this is the most recent and over the last couple of years. We use uh, innovation, I, what's it called, idea management tool, that's it, called Spigot. And we brought that in a couple years ago, and actually the vendor still hosts this. We brought it in at first to manage our MITRE Innovation Program, which is our internal um, R&D um, activity within MITRE. We used it to have our, the, the, the tech staff submit their ideas within Spigot so that it has visibility to others across MITRE and also allows for collaboration. We've since expanded that to use it for dollars and cents program, which is um, soliciting ideas from MITRE staff on how we could cut, co cut costs at MITRE. Does anybody else use an idea management platform? <coughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about it, Jean? Uh, well, we use ideation with NASA both on the public side and internally. Um, on the public side, we're using IdeaScale, which is a, <coughs> available from the federal government to elicit ideas and, and conversations with the public for what they might want the agency to do. And then internally we're using user voice as part of our uh, Facebook platform, which is our internal social networking piece. And that's kind of the same thing, but just restricted internally. Anyone else use an idea and how's management software and is it working for you? Yeah, yeah we've uh, implemented our own kind of a home for own activity. So it seems fairly effective. Yep. It can be a monster sometimes, too. <laughs> Thanks. Multi-generational workforce. Some four challenges here. The first one is our workforce demographics. Um, we've got average age about 47 at MITRE, and 20% of our staff have only been at MITRE for five years. Little concerned here, okay? The folks that are getting ready for retirement, the economy is getting better, so they say. Um, are they going to retire? What about that lost knowledge? Do we have a concern? The folks on the other end that are new at MITRE, huge learning curve coming to MITRE, uh, very different culture to get used to. Are they going to be frustrated or are we going to be able to keep them? Do we have a way of, of helping them um, assimilate to MITRE? Our diversity inclusion, very strong program, our corporate diversity action council. The focus here, though, is not necessarily um, you know, gender or race, it's more about diversity of thought. Uh, they really want to, to encourage holistic thinking across MITRE. We, we have a, a book club, uh, we bring in authors and our CIO also hosts to talk about different books and Groundswell was one of them as well as uh, The Tipping Point at, other t at another time. The Millinery Advisory Committee, this is a uh, breakfast that is sponsored by our CEO, Al Grasso, and he meets with millenniums from the company, in both in, we're headquartered in both Bedford, 
Massachusetts and McLean, Virginia. I'm in the Massachusetts office. Al actually meets with the, the newer generation at MITRE for breakfast in McLean and in Bedford all, on alternating months to be, so he can hear issues and ideas from them. The red team, remember, the old term was graybeards, probably not politically correct anymore. Want to be able to encourage younger participation as, um, as, as part of the teams. Also on that same note, fast track, that is something that uh, in the brainstorming phases of projects, they make it a point to bring in the younger generation so that you can have the new ideas fresh and then you can have the folks who have been at the company uh, talking about the alignment of the vision and the mission and the goals and their experiences at MITRE and how maybe one idea may not work or what a great idea the millennials have come up with. <coughs> Attracting a younger generation in terms of recruiting, trying to get MITRE as the employer of choice, probably many similar things that your own companies are doing. We have an active student recruiting program. We have summer interns and co-ops. We have scientific, technical, and engineering mathematical outreach program. Our STEM program really is all voluntary, and there's a lot that's going on. I actually printed out the pages before I came out. Uh, we have folks at MITRE that are going to high schools and to colleges and really encouraging studying of, of science and technology. These last two things I'm going to talk about next, our web presence on our public site as well as our social networking tool. Now I've talked a lot so far, <laughs> knowledge transfer, workforce generational um, challenges. Before I get into the web tool presence, does anybody want me to take a breath here so they can get in a question? Yes. I actually did have a question. Um, in an earlier conversation, I was talking with someone about how do you motivate people to share their knowledge, and especially in an environment where nothing's mandated, and you were saying that nothing's mandated at MITRE. Can you talk about some of the mechanisms that are used there? Well, uh, having the, the long-standing culture has definitely been helpful. And I think uh, there's, um, there's peer pressure, as I mentioned, people calling me, telling me to put stuff in my transfer folder. So you have peer pressure from the bottom up, and you also have some top down. And the story I remember most when I've asked people, well, when did knowledge management stick? Uh, with the story that was given to me, there was two of them. One was um, MITRE has a lot of great technology in our, what we call them team rooms. I don't know if you have the same thing at JPL? Is that where you said you were from? So we have 265 uh, VTC rooms with dual screens. Um, so you can show whatever in, in, a, in a team room PC so that you can show a presentation on one. You can see somebody as a, in a VTC connecting another part of, of MITRE on our 65 locations on the other. And there were some officers in the room when a presentation was being given. And the one officer said to the individual who gave the presentation, now this presentation is in your transfer folder, right? so the rest of us can find it. So, of course, nobody wanted to look like an idiot, so from then on, that was the big thing, making sure that your presentations were in a place that can be searched and found, so a lot of top-down. And the other one was similar um, um, embarrassing moment, so I'm told, and I don't remember the officers' names, but um, resumes. We highly encourage that you put a resume in these transfer folders so that they're searchable. Well, with uh, Microsoft, being what it is, um, the little properties box, sometimes people don't fill that out. So there was one individual who had um, taken a resume from one of the officers and used that resume as a template and then posted that resume on his About Me folder. But when you go to search for it, it still had in the properties box the other officer's name. <laughs> But it's, it's a lot of top down and a lot of, you know, it's, it's both ways. I can't say that there's a magic bullet and I'm, yes. Sure, okay, well, yes, they're shared folders. I guess that's a, a preferred name. They are, in terms of the technology and how that works, bear with me on that, I'll describe how we use them. So we have three folders that are, are automatically set up for every employee when they come in. One is uh, an About Me folder. So you put your resume in there and that is shared to, with the entire corporation. You can do our, a Google search and ask for specifically about me folder. So if I wanted to know how many people at MITRE spoke Farsi, I actually did try this the other day. I would go into our Google search, applied search, Farsi, about me folders only. I get 131 results that come back that people have identified Farsi as a language in their about me folder. Not that I have a contract that I need Farsi on, but you get the point. The other one is um, the, the transfer folders or a, 
a shared space that you can, you can put anything in your transfer folder. You can also put anything in somebody else's transfer folder. And I don't mean that maliciously. I mean that in, um, if I would call our information desk telling them that I need to do some research on something that I'm working on. They're going to find, they're going to go into their database. They're going to bring back all those documents. They're going to put them in my transfer folder so that I can, I can go and find them. So you don't, we don't get malicious activities that go on. Uh, we keep in those transfer folders open. And the third one is a private space. So if I'm in a team room, uh, this team room one day and another team room the other day, but let's say I have some financial information or um, employee, it's getting that time for employee P&Ds where you do your assessments, I don't want that known to anybody. I'm going to put that in a private folder. I only get access to that. Any else? Yes. Um. Yes. No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, hmm. we, I know we had d conducted, before I got here, so it must have been six years ago, a social networking analysis that our uh, consultant did, Patty Anklin, specifically within CINT. And typical social network analysis, they ask you a question, who do you talk to, who do you get the information from? And after they fill out all the survey, then she does the spider web diagram to see who's connecting to who. I don't know that MITRE ever did anything with that, in with that information. But to follow up just a little bit on the TEM one, what we're re-looking at how we can make the TEMs more effective. And one of the things we are doing is adding a survey at the end of the TEMs to ask participants what value they got out of the TEMs. And connecting to other people is one of those questions. Did this help you connect with others? Yes. Yes. Oh, somebody asked me that in the hallway earlier today, too. Um, Sure, the question was about um, the Thames. If you're gonna spend a whole day there, how do you charge that time? And when we did our quick look study uh, for the, one of the things that we did do was call TEM hosts to see what their challenges are. We did call TEM participants to see their challenges and the benefits from TEMs. The charge number is creeping up. But I also have asked, um, because I, I work on the enterprise level on overhead. I am not direct to a project. But it's my understanding from talking to the chief engineers as they have made a, a, um, a deal with the government that TEMs are internal to MITRE, TEM, uh, MITRE and the sponsors. And they benefit. The knowledge that's gained at the TEMs from MITRE employees benefits the government and, thus, and benefits their projects so they're able to charge that to the... Yes. Back to the transfer folders. Yep. Have you tried kind of profiling of people's capabilities and stuff like that for what they share? Um, we take, we take a look at how frequently that they're used. Now, unfortunately, for, um, for the About Me folders, only 40% have resumes in there. Yeah, but, but as they publish, that gives you a profile of what they do, what their interests are. You can extrapolate what they as a person can provide. Not so, looking at that. Yes. Sure, great question. I, we don't have that as an issue. Um, and it might be because it's such a strong culture of bringing the corporation to bear and it's more of a quick pro quo. You know one day you're going to need an answer to something quickly. So when somebody does ask you something out of respect, you try, you, if you see a question on a list serve or an email sent to you directly, because uh, one of the things we can do with our expertise finder is, this might answer your question a little bit, is if I, um, the way our expertise finder works is it, it draws off what has, been what has been published in our transfer folders. When I say published, it doesn't mean final documents. It can be anything. 
So we do a search to say, hmm, who's, who's got something on knowledge management? So the lists come up, you can click from, and then we search to the, we change to the expertise view, and now their pictures come up with that, and then we're able to click, um, click on that, and then the top 10 come up in terms of being able to send an email directly to the top 10 on that list that the expertise finder has found. So you can quickly send an email to them. The email is pre-populated. I found your name on the listserv in this particular area. Can you help me out? And then you make your contacts. But she poses a really great question that I'd like to throw out at the group in terms of how do you guys deal with trust? What are some of the things that have worked with for you? Face-to-face -face interaction. Very true. Anyone else want to share? Well, you, you saw who she was, so there was a networking break. Remember the goal, the, the uh, touch with the five people? Whoever said it over here in the corner? So our, our Web 2.0. So if you go to uh, www.mitre.org, you will see our homepage. And under News and Events, you can dr drill down, and this is what you will see, our social networking apps and RSS feeds. And here you can see our RSS feeds from our latest news. The Mitre Digest was just an internal uh, product that's publicly released. Career news, tech papers, cloud computing. And over here on the left, you can see our social networking. Yes? Uh, any studies on recent time, lack of a better word, of people being in those areas? We just started this within this last year. And when I talked to our corporate communications folks on, on the metrics and who's going here and is this going to be a long lasting thing, um, I can tell you that we're trying to use this as a um, as, a, as a way to disseminate news about MITRE and also as trying to encourage MITRE being the employer of choice in terms of people looking at MITRE. Um, our numbers, I, I don't, personally don't think they're that, that high, so give me, give me one second on, on that one. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out here, and I have a screenshot of it, is we just released our, of course, there's an app for that for MITRE um, that you can download. Let's see if I can answer that. So one of the things you'll notice, uh, this is a recent change our corporate comm had made, they showed me. On the left-hand side here, we're trying to keep our branding very consistent as we're trying to disseminate our news. Now, I have screenshots of the, of, of the um, Facebook and, and Twitter and YouTube. I can, I can tell you that the information will be the same on each one of those in terms of how we're trying to promote MITRE. It's just a different avenue. Uh, because uh, through, and what I mean by that is when I talk to corporate comm about, well, if it's the same news, why are we using five different channels? Because everybody has their personal preference. And Twitter is one of them. Um, I couldn't remember buying username and log on before, for the life of me. But I think, I think the number was about seven, 600 followers um, for Twitter. And there's somebody in corporate comm's job who, who does this. We also have a Facebook page about 800 followers followers on Facebook. What's interesting about Facebook is what we tried to do earlier this summer and actually tried to put ad camp or, or job openings, advertising them on Facebook to see how we were doing. It's my understanding, talking with HR, that we kept that open for about three weeks. That was kind of the, the, bell, the end of the bell curve in terms of after three weeks, no one's looking at those anymore. We did get 250 hits for the uh, how many people were looking at the jobs, and I think six people actually applied. So when, it, when you see numbers kind of that low, I did ask HR, are we going to continue to do this? And they said, yes, yes, we are, because it is some, something that people do, do look at for a ter in terms of getting jobs. But on the same behalf, they also shared with me that of, of the one or two folks that were hired through the Facebook ad, when they did talk to them, um, one of the things that they shared with them is that, you know, we don't really don't go to Facebook for look for jobs. We go to LinkedIn. Preferred that you do. We'd like to keep them separately. A personal for Facebook and LinkedIn for professional. YouTube, got one of those too. Uh, I was actually on there because I hadn't seen the videos before I got here. A um, lot of interesting stories about, about MITRE's past. Uh, a lot of um, personal testimonies about people who had work, worked in MITRE, works at, work at MITRE and the things that they work on. And then the app. Uh, this was, I think, within the last two months that we actually had this available. I, is it the I store iTunes? Uh, where do you download it? ITunes. Thank you, iTunes. Uh, <laughs> there is an app that contains stuff about MITRE, stuff about our work, as well as maps and directions for our main facilities. 
the other thing on our, our site is student opportunities page. Uh, under employment, there's a special part for student opportunities because we do have co-ops, undergraduate, graduate, uh, uh, through affiliations through colleges or, or students by themselves coming into MITRE. And last, this past summer, I actually looked at this video last week, it's a video of our interns telling about the great time that they had at MITRE, the things that they work on, the independence that was given to them, the freedom that was given to them to work in the company, and how much they really enjoyed it. The other thing I wanted to point out on this page is the, the student chat box that you can see in the middle. I believe the technology is called Mebo. Anybody's familiar with it? Did I say that right? Thanks. And the reason HR wanted to do this, it is a box that you can chat directly with HR, and it's anonymous, interestingly enough. And the reason they wanted to do this is because if you go to the MITRE site, put in a query, send an email, it kind of makes its way to HR, but not always. They wanted more of a personal touch uh, with people who wanted to, to learn more about MITRE, and especially to getting a job at MITRE. So that chat is available. We really, truly will get a human <laughs> on the other end from East Coast time, from our working hours, 7.45 to 4.30, that you can chat with and ask about job opportunities. The MITRE's public forum, and how can I get my notes on this one, because this is relatively new. Um, this public, on our public site, uh, it's called, uh, the forum is called Ahead, Ahead in the Clouds. And this is to provide our government agencies with meaningful answers to common cloud computing questions because this is a challenge for our sponsors. And they draw from lead thinkers in the field. Each month there's a new question. Now, I, I, I have to tell you, this is not as open as it, as it looks. <laughs> so yes, we do pose a question there, but we're very careful on who we ask to answer it. We, have, we know the, the experts who are from industry. We talk to them ahead of time to ask them to craft an answer. And that answer gets posted, posted on the web. That's how that works. So our tool set, across the top are our categories of finding information and expertise, storing content, co uh, creating, co hello, can't say it, collaborating, co-creating and publishing, and networking community interaction. Across the, this direction are the many tools that we have at MITRE. The good, better, best is kind of following the hotel check marks. <laughs> The ones that have three check marks are the tools that were actually created for a specific purpose, and that purpose is that what's in those columns. The tools that have one or two check marks means, doesn't mean you can't use them, but I mean, you might get your answer, but it's not the best bet. What I want to focus on here on my last five minutes is our social networking tool to the company, internal and external. We needed a way to communicate with our customers and our sponsors and academia. We brought in, uh, it's an open source platform called ELG, and this is our fa Facebookish type site. Looks very familiar, I'm sure. For those people who are on Facebook, across the top is my connections and my groups. Very similar, you have your profile that you fill out. You can see the groups over there on the opposite side. And across here is the activity wall, our activities and what's going on. We uh, co-hosted a meeting with, with NASA on a knowledge management forum, so that's just what this, we set this group up to be able to talk with everybody before and after to continue that knowledge transfer. So you can kind of see what that profile looks like. And then here you can see what the agenda and the group activity was and the postings. So we've been using this for about a year. What do our users think at MITRE? There was a group at MITRE that conducted a, a study and talked to about 21 people. How are you using this? What's the value? So four findings that came out of this. One was it extended our online support for project collaboration. What that means simply is it's a really neat tool to be able to post a document and comment on it in one single location. You see a lot of that. Somebody will post a, uh, post a uh, document and then comment on it. The second one, the online communities, this is self-managed. It took me three seconds to set that site up. Very easy. Now, since it's an internal to MITRE site, if you would like to join it, I, just, I need to invite you. You're not going to be able to find it by searching Google on the open. I do need to invite you. The lurking, very useful to be able to see um, what other people are doing, to follow them, to see what new communities have been established. 
And number three, the use of handshake for networking. Very interesting. You got a lot of people sitting back and looking and, and watching folks. Well, what are, what are they doing? What are they working on? And it's not when they look, when they send at, when somebody puts out a document that they've created, it's not necessarily about the content that people are looking at, it's who the person is. They learn more about the author. And lastly, the, we really expected to see this for a way of boasting about uh, handshake, a way of boasting about activities people are working on. But we saw very little of that as, as a, um, um, a, a platform for, for blogging, for personal blogs. And we don't see it as replacing other social media, other social tools. We see it as a supplement to other tools at MITRE. Our challenges is, as you pointed out earlier, someone asked the question, how do we determine what success is? What's, what's the value of this? That is something we are looking at it. This little cloud diagram on the side, spiderweb diagram on the side is a diagnostic tool we had used in a snapshot uh, for a handshake in terms of the, the, the circles the larger the circles, the more the activity in terms of what, who people were connecting to, what they were using Handshake for. But that is a challenge. How, we, how do we want to diagnose those? How do we integrate it within the company? And how does it fit into the existing MITRE culture? That's where we are with that. Any questions? Yes. yes. Um, I have a question. This is the manager, the uh, title of the one that... Yes. Yeah. Um, um, I think I know what you're asking. Are you asking me, do we set up our handshake site specifically with our government sponsors? Um, we, uh, with our SharePoint, when we set up groups in SharePoint, it usually is specifically with uh, a one-to-one. -one. But with Handshake, SharePoint's a little clumsy, it's clumsy to set up. With Handshake, it's very easy to set up. Anyone can set up a group. So if they feel as though they have a quorum for conversation, regardless if it's one sponsor or many sponsors, and see, that's the beauty of Handshake. It's a great, a great tool for cross-organizational collaboration. So anybody can join, anyone can set that up. I don't know that we can, I don't even know if you could physically stovepipe that into only one, one sponsor or one FFRDC. Did that answer your question? Yes, so because we're looking into how do we make connections? Because we're also um, looking at the uh, value of this. And You can lock the sites down. You can lock them down, yes, so that others can't get, in, get into them. Yeah, if you're trying to do that. Very easy tool to use. Yes? Actually, going from the other side of that, from the government side, I know there are plans in place to do something like that from government server. With the government server, we have a tool which is really not used at all. Um, we, you know, within the Air Force, it's supposed to be set up by projects. And it's supposed to be able to be locked down. And the idea originally was that we built to invite contractors in so that the contractors working on that project would be able to go into the site and do that kind of collaboration. But as near as I can tell, that's never happened. And you with the Air Force yeah. RL? Uh, I'm, no, I'm with RZ. I'm with I'm with Any other questions? Yes. Um, I have a question about the is that permissible, Mark? Is that permissible? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, you showed that network. Yes. The last time. Two years ago, you asked to recreate, redesign, build structures. Or architectural organization, putting people's goals in each other to make a face to face contact much more often. And then, members of the land. That's a great question. No, we have not. In fact, I think that was when we were, did the first social networking analysis that I think that was what was supposed to come out of it, is to see where the, those connections were not being made and try to facilitate connections. I don't know. We have not done that. Because you can see that people sitting in the same office, they never connect each other. Yeah. So, but there is far away people are connected to 
And you can also see the hubs in terms of where, um, if, if, if someone's on the verge of retirement, to see their connections, to see how important it is for them to be able to expand. Yeah, great observation. I, so I don't have information for you on that one. We had, yes? Oh, oh, sorry. thought that was two. OK, go ahead. The second one, you mentioned that you are you're probably not. Yes. So do you have any kind of intellectual capital state to manage the sector? Oh, you're trying to say what our ROI, asking me what our ROI and our metrics are? Oh, that is so hard. We're actually working with APQC on a knowledge management measurement research, um, knowledge, knowledge management measurement research study. And we're trying to, they're working with us um, to, to come up with templates to try and do exactly what you're saying, do the business alignment from uh, the business, from the, the corporate to the business unit, to the business process, to the knowledge management activity, to the knowledge management process. We're actually right in the middle of doing that. It's been a very hard dis discussion with our CIO and business operations officer because we don't track I mean, I'm not saying that profitability or performance or cycle time is not important, but it's not something we track from a fiscal perspective. Now, Stu, you're here from aerospace. Do you, do you have the similar challenge in terms of uh, tracking knowledge management to uh, an ROI? I think that uh, we sort of gave up the ROI aspect of that. It's hard to, it's hard to have an ROI tracking. Yeah. Around knowledge, so we're, we're focused on other metrics. So we're not so much interested in trying to demonstrate an ROI because it's elusive for us. So. Very hard. Yeah. No more hard questions for you. Next. <laughs> you said your communities of interest yes. were voluntary, self-forming. Self yes. So does that mean that they're they can be hobbies? They can be yes. just about anything. Yes. And so is that on company time? <laughs> no, no. Okay, but uh, so I was going to say, if it is, do you find that builds trust? I mean, just if, it's, if that's a common practice to, for these things to form? You know, we, um, one of the centers have actually spent some money uh, on a list serve, list tree, it's a tree map on our list serves tracking activity in terms of where the hubs are. And, I, and it's a color-coded map at any particular time of the day you can log in to see where the activity is. And I have to say, when I have looked at that periodically, I'm not seeing underwater basket weaving or dancing. As, as, as conversations. And I think that's might, that might be where Handshake might, might take off. It's so easy to set up, might being able to have a little club together with certain people. But in terms of the company time, it hasn't been an issue at this point. In the back. I, I'm curious. When you were talking about the, um, the private space versus the transfer yes. folder, and how much self-discipline and cultural peer pressure there is about how much extraneous work material gets posted mm. publicly versus filtered and kept private and, and, and only what's considered to be more valuable goes into the other folder? In terms of what's, what's private, as long as they don't fill up their space, no one's going to send them any nasty grams. Transfer, fol transfer folders, I have a lot of stuff in mind, and occasionally I'll get a note from IT to say, you need to clean it up a bit. But where we're seeing the issue is kind of the, on the other end, the user end. In fact, uh, we did a KM Pulse survey, because we did a main survey two years ago. We did follow up with some subset of the questions uh, two weeks ago. So I was looking at the data on the plane out. And now one of the problems we're starting to see is a lot of frustration is the love-hate relationship with Google. Glad we have it, hard to find relevant, um, current information. And be because people don't follow up with cleaning out their closets, uh, like mine at home. Yeah, that's starting to be a problem. Any other questions? Yes? How do you uh, handle protecting other people's copyright information? Oh, we, um, we run searches occasionally. And when we, as in corporate communications, knowledge services, where I work, we run, we run them a few times to include checks on FOUO. And we send nasty grams out. No copyright information. No FOUO. And then our information services uh, lead, Ethel Solomon, is, uh, comes, is from the world of Special Libraries Association. And she is vigilant in terms of um, having copyright notices and statements out there not to do that. But we have no police. There's no fines. But it's just not encouraged. Any others? Yes. 
Stu. Have you guys had to deal with the classified messaging incident yet? Say a little bit more. Where someone might accidentally post oh. you know, government secrets on your social sites. Not talking about Wik WikiLeaks now, are you? <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm sorry? Oh, oh, sure. Sorry about that. So he was asking if we've had any incidents with people accidentally putting classified material on, uh, on our intranet for others to accidentally find. I have not sat with our corporate security person to have that conversation. I know occasionally accidents happen in email, um, and I do know that we have some pretty strong procedures in place to um, to to clean things up, but I'm not, but I'm I'm not familiar with a particular incident that created a lot of damage. Is there? So were were the email procedures uh, or policies sufficient for enabling the social technologies? Oh, um, so maybe the what you're asking is when we tried to release Handshake. I know where you're going with that one. Yeah, we went to Infosec, and that took a few briefings to convince them that this would not be a risk? That's a great question because it is open to the outside. You can publish documents on there. Yeah. Yeah. We had to get the clearance from InfoSec. And fortunately, nothing has happened. Any other questions? Well, I'm almost the last thing keeping you from lunch, but I think Christina and Mark have another, and Kehoe have another presenter, right? Yes. Thank you, everybody.